My name is Lisa Wersko and I'm the PTSD coach. Um, this is my first podcast. So if you're um, listening only, then you're going to miss out on all the effort that I put into uh, doing my hair. Um, it's, it's not that big of a deal. Uh, if you're watching this on video, hello, uh, I may make references to my surrounds, in which case if you're listening only, um, they might not make much sense, but realistically they're probably not all that relevant. Um, I've had a few people um, via my Facebook page and group and in person um, express some curiosity around my story. And so I was having to think about the best way that I could convey that to you and thought that I would give this a go. So I'm really keen for your feedback and please let me know if this works and if it really doesn't um, and I'll make adjustments as appropriate. Uh, if this is not a thing I should do, then <laughs> let me know. Um, so just some things I wanted to um, to start with. Today I'm going to talk to you about my story. Um, so this is going to be my story about what happened to me, uh, how I ended up with PTSD. Sorry, I'm just popping a timer on so I know how long I've been talking at you. Um, to try and keep it to an hour. So, um, yeah, how I ended up with PTSD and how I ended up not having PTSD. Um, so that's what this is going to be for this se this um, episode, session. I'm not sure what to call it. Um, so if that doesn't interest you at all, just sign up to my email list and I will send you an email when the next one comes out and that will not be all about me. So if that doesn't interest you, just skip to the next one. Um, if you are one of those people that wants to know how I ended up doing this, why I'm doing this, um, then stay with me and hopefully all your questions will be answered, I hope. Um, so obviously I need to outline a couple of things. Um, this is really new for me, so please excuse some nerves, some umming and ahhing. I do talk with my hands a lot, so you probably see me waving around with my hands if you're watching it on video. Um, I'm also, as you can see behind me, I tried to find a nice spot. I'm doing this at home and I have four cats, so there is potential for a cat interruption, um, just so you're aware of that. And anything that I say, uh, any opinions I express are obviously only mine. Uh, I'm not affiliated with any organisation or any higher body. I only speak on my own behalf. I speak from the heart. Um, so you may not agree with everything I say and that is totally fine. I'm okay with that. There's probably, there's lots of things I don't agree with. Um, so that's fine. If that's not for you, don't take it on board. Um, on that same note, I guess, if what you feel uh, I express or what I share is not relevant to you or not appropriate or anything like that, switch off. Uh, you, I, I, I um, encourage everybody to be in charge of what they consume in terms of um, media and input and be aware of how it's affecting you and absolutely if what I am... Um, uh, sharing with you today is not affecting you in a positive way, turn, turn me off. I'm totally cool with that. Be in charge of what you're putting into your body, uh, not just in terms of food, but in terms of what you're listening to, what you're hearing, what you're feeling. So, yeah, if, if I'm not on the list, I shouldn't be on the list, then take me off. That's totally cool. Right, now that we have that out of the way, um, I'm estimating this to go for about an hour. I um, have made myself a huge cup of tea, as you can see. Um, so I recommend that you do the same, unless you're driving in which on a podcast, then don't make a cup of tea. But if you're home, sit down and settle in with a cuppa and, um, and I'll tell you my story. Um, this I haven't scripted this. This is from the heart. There might be some rambling and there may be the odd... Slightly naughty word. I'll try and keep it minimal because I don't want anyone to to not be able to uh, view this or listen to this. 
Um, but it, it's also a little bit how I talk. Anyone that knows me knows that. So where does it start? Where does PTSD start? I feel like, and I've been thinking about this for a few days, I feel like to give you guys the context that I think you need to understand where I'm coming from and how this happened to me, I need you to understand um, things from way back, way back. So that's what I said, settle in, get a tea, you know, Nana Lisa's going to tell a story. Um, so the house I grew up in uh, was pretty blessed. So my parents um, were together and happily married when I grew up as a kid. I had one younger brother. And we had a normal nuclear house, you know, mum, dad, two kids, uh, dad went to work, mum looked after us. Um, she worked for the first few years and then, and then decided to stay home. Um, some of you may, and I don't want to presume, but some of you may know um, my dad or my uncle. They're both pretty well respected in their, in their chosen fields. They both work in different aspects of medicine in Melbourne, in Victoria, or um, one in Tassie. So I, I grew up in a medical family. Uh, dad was a doctor, uncle was a doctor, mum's got a pseudo-medical background. I always knew that I wanted to do something that was helping people. And, and to be honest, I think I was always that kid. Uh, you know, as, as a kid in primary school, somebody fell over in the yard, I was always the one rushing over and sending somebody to go and get a teacher while I comforted them and let them know it was going to be okay so I fell the monkey bars or something. Um, I was always that kid. And then as a teenager at the parties, you know, there's, there's always one at a teenage party that's kind of like the mum who stays sober and makes sure everybody's rolled on their side if they're being sick and, you know, telling everyone to drink lots of water and intersperse their drinks with water. That was me. That was me. So I've always been a carer. I've always been the sort of person that looks after others. That's just fundamental to my being. Um, and I'm not apologising for that. I'm just explaining that it's always been in me. Um, after I finished school, um, having wanted to be a doctor since I was six years old and then discovering that chemistry and I were not for each other, um, I travelled overseas for a year and I lived in Israel for a year and then when I came back I had to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. And I knew I wanted to make people feel good so I dabbled with the idea briefly of owning a, um, a lounge, like a bar, like a loungy bar, drinks venue and having people come and relax and have a few drinks and that would be my space to provide them with like an alternate living room that they could, um, they could come and hang out in. Uh, so I went and did that for eight months at TAFE and they taught me how to upsell and um, it felt really horrible and dirty and I'm just not good at that. I've never worked retail for any length of time. So that um, learning how to sell things to people that I didn't really want or need was not congruent with me and I knew that pretty early on. So I pretty bailed on that. Um, and then I had a discussion with, a friend who said, well, you know, you're really good at um, helping people and massage and stuff like that. Maybe you could do something like that. And I scoffed. I was like, are you serious? He suggested aromatherapy, <laughs> which I thought at the time was hilarious. I said to him, do you understand, like, my family is, like, super educated and medical and, like, sciencey doctor people. Um, I was pretty sure that at that point I would get disowned if I said, Mum, Dad, I'm studying aromatherapy. But what it and and I have no issue with aromatherapy. Um, I I'm a I'm super accepting of any sort of modality if it works for you, go for it. And we'll talk about that in um in some later sessions in terms of my opinions on different modalities. I'm pretty much a go for it, and if that's the thing that helps you, then then do it person. Um but it was, that was not something I was prepared to go to my parents with. Um, so what it did make me realise was there was a whole gamut of possibilities I really hadn't considered as career options. So I went back to the olden days. We had a book, and some of you will remember the VTAC guide. It was about that fat 
and I skipped well past the, the business and law sections because I knew that wasn't for me. Um, and I stumbled across paramedics. And at that point, that was uh, the year I began paramedics at Victoria University. It was actually the second year that that course was running as, a, as it was in the day, a, a HEX um, course. Uh, prior to that, the only way to get educated, for those that don't know, the only way to get educated in ambulance was to essentially be employed by an ambulance service and then be paid to study. Uh, which, long story, I attempted that route. It didn't work in the time frame I needed it to work. So I ended up um, doing the university option, which was totally cool. Um, during that time that I was completing my studies at Victoria University in paramedics, I was also, uh, for a time, two and a half years, I think, I worked uh, in patient transport and some of you will work in patient transport now or have done work in patient transport so for those not familiar it's um, our ambulance service is funded by the state government and that used to also do the non-emergency transport uh, um, movement of patients uh, and then uh, quite a few years ago, that was that side of the business was privatised. And so now we have private companies that do that on behalf of the ambulance service. So I worked for one of those companies for two and a half years, two years of which, by my choice, were permanent night shift, which uh, now I look back and think I was insane, but one of those crazy things you do in your 20s. Um, and the reason I chose to do permanent nights was because the acuity of work was better. Um, as far as I was concerned, I would rather, I wanted to work with sicker people and um, there can be a shortfall in the emergency side overnight, in which case the non-emergency side tended, and keep in mind this was like 15 years ago, um, so I'm not sure of how things work now. I'm sure some of you are going to type back to me and go, they're exactly the same, it's exactly the same, nothing's changed. Um, but at the time, the non-emergency side would often fill that shortfall and I liked doing that work. I liked doing that emergency border type work because that's what I went to uni for and that's, that's, you know, what I wanted to do eventually. So it came to a point after a couple of years that I decided, well, I either, uh, I, I had applied for the Melbourne Ambulance Service. We had, we had two at the time. We had a Melbourne one and we had a regional area one. Uh, and I applied for the Melbourne one and didn't, I wasn't successful in my application at that time. Uh, and it got to a point where I thought, okay, well, I can keep doing transport work and stay in Melbourne where my, my family and my friends and all my support and everything is, or I can go out of my comfort zone and I can move to the bush and I can go regional and, um, but do the sort of work I want to do. So do a proper proper emergency work in emergency ambulance. So that's basically what I did. I applied and I, I got a position with, at the time, was Rural Ambulance Victoria and um, and I moved. I moved away from my family and I moved away from my friends and I moved away from my support. Um, I was, and I try really hard to make eye contact with you guys, but this is part of, Part of what I'm going to tell you is emotional and um, one of my coping strategies that I learnt over a period of time was to break eye contact. So I am trying really hard. Don't, uh, don't take it personally if I look away. Um, as I tell you what, what happened. So basically initially I got sent to Bendigo. That's where I initially got a role, which was great because my uncle was there at the time so I pretty much um, moved into his guest room and we got to hang out and get to know each other which was really cool because um, we we used to be close when I was little so it was really good to to reconnect with him I guess over that time. Um, Bendigo was a tough place and like I said look this is 2000 and five um so we're talking yeah 12 years ago um and 
I'm pretty certain things have changed a lot. Like for one, Bendigo isn't even one station anymore. There's several in the area. They've they've split up how they're um, deploying their resources. So it's totally it's totally different. Um, so I can only speak as to what it was at the time and what my experience was. So at the time that I got to Bendigo, um, according to my recollections, there was about 36 staff members. 32 of them were male. Most of those, I would say, were over 35, 40. Uh, and there were four girls on the roster and one of them was part-time. So there were some issues with regard, and I'm really carefully choose my words because I don't want to upset anyone. I just want to relate to you what my experience was. And, again, I'm only representing my perception of events. That's all I can tell you because that's all I can experience is my perception of what occurred. So with that in mind, <laughs> my experience was that they were less than welcoming of a female they were less than welcoming of and this is on the whole there are definitely individuals at that time that made huge efforts to include me and support me and I I, t I don't want to I don't want to dismiss them but the general attitude was um I was not really, I hadn't earned an opinion because I was female. I was university educated as opposed to trained on the job. As I explained before, the university course was still really new as a pathway into ambulance at that time. Um, and I was pretty loud. <laughs> I'm really curious as to whether you guys think that's different or the same as now. <laughs> um, so I was 25 and I felt like, you know, I'd lived overseas for a year. I'd studied myself. I'd lived out of home. I felt like I'd formed some pretty strong opinions about how the world should be and how the world is and politics and religious views. And, you know, I was pretty, pretty sure of myself at 25. Um, I suspect that contributed to me not going down so well in that environment. Um, so, have, have a sip of your tea. I'm just pausing for tea. For those that can't see, spearmint today, thanks for asking. Um, so, my time at my first station in Bendigo was about eight or nine months. And over that time, it was made very clear to me that my job as a student female paramedic was to keep my head down, study, listen to what everybody had to teach me and keep my mouth shut. Um, my opinion on the whole was, was not valid. No one was really interested. Um, and it certainly was not a warm, welcoming environment in which if I was having some issues with either clinical questions to do with the job itself or um, personal stuff, I guess, to do with maybe moving over two hours from my home and my support and my family, um, I didn't really feel like there was anyone I could talk to. There was It was not an environment where... Um, there was anyone I felt I could trust that cared. I didn't really feel like anyone cared about my problems. Um, that was definitely the vibe that I got. And that made it really hard um, because I really felt alone and isolated. And as you can imagine, in your first nine months to, to year of being on road as a paramedic, um, as the cliche goes, you see some terrible things. And I did see some terrible things and I experienced some terrible things and was pretty much left to my own devices to figure it out. Um, I worked with some people that we obviously had a personality clash with that was attempted to be dealt with by management, um, who then, after going through that process, 
rostered me back with the same individual that I'd had personality clashes with. So uh, I'm not sure what was going on there. That was that was their plan at the time. So it got to a point um, early 2006 where I was I was not in a good place. Um, I was really quite depressed. I felt bullied. I felt unsupported. Um, I felt really, really lonely and and on unstable ground. Uh, as I said, I, I was staying in my my uncle's guest house for the shifts that I was on, and um, sorry, his guest room for the shifts that I was on, and the days off, I would drive back to Melbourne to hang out in my share house with my friends in in inner city Melbourne. So essentially I lived in my car. That's pretty much I spent a lot of time on the freeway between Melbourne and Bendigo and um and I paid rent to keep my stuff in Melbourne and but the place I was living in inverted commas in Bendigo, I wasn't really home. It was I was a guest there. So I guess the difference that makes is that, you know, I couldn't come home and kick my shoes off and leave them on the floor and just go, oh, I've had enough today or leave my dishes in the sink and go, you know what, I'll deal with it in the morning because it wasn't my house. So I really didn't have a space where I could truly unwind and because I was so motivated to get out of town on my days off, I didn't really have a social life. I didn't have hobbies. I didn't have a lot outside of work because I just wanted to go when I didn't have to be there for my shifts. So after about nine months, early 20, 2006, I um, said to someone in management, I need to move. And I, I knew that they had a plan to move me to Shepparton because there was a student before me that was supposed to go from Bendigo to Shepparton and um, she'd moved to Melbourne. Hi, Jackie, if you're watching or listening. Um, so she moved to Metro, which was totally cool. It means that I was the next out, so to speak, of Bendigo and they owed Shepard in a student. So May 2006, I moved to Shep and I was thrilled. I was so happy because it wasn't Bendigo. <laughs> Basically, that was it. That's why I was really happy because it wasn't Bendigo and I was not having fun and I didn't like it and I was sad. Um, unfortunately, my reputation, which possibly was not accurate, had preceded me and, and the, um, the ambulance grapevine had played its role and... Uh, people knew things about me or thought they knew things about me before I arrived at Shepparton. And so on my arrival there, um, there was already some um, rumour or gossip going around about what sort of student I'd been, uh, how I got into ambulance, the role my father had played in that, uh, which was zero, by the way for the record, nothing. Um, so I was really happy when I got to Shep initially and then I got off to a bit of a rocky start. Um, I didn't know anyone in town. I had some beautiful, beautiful people take me under their wing and invite me to their house and feed me and do beautiful things and to this day they're still um, beautiful friends of mine and I'm I'm, to, I'm blessed to still have them in my life after all this time. I can't believe it's been so long, but all this time. Um, but again, really, you know, I didn't know anyone. I was really isolated. I don't drink. I don't smoke. All social club events, Okay, my perception at the time was that all social club events revolved around going to the pub for drinks, which as a non-drinker really didn't interest me. Um, I was also prone to migraines and things like that. So um, being around cigarette smoke and stinky um, 
band venues and things like that um, really set off some health concerns for me, so it really didn't interest me. So I didn't avail myself of those social club activities. Uh, so for most of 2006, my life consisted of going to work, going to Coles on the way home, picking up something for dinner, going home, watching DVDs on the couch with the cat, and then go to bed and get up and go to work and repeat. And that was it. Um, Shepparton is a little bit further than Bendigo from Melbourne. And by that point, I was really sick of moving around. So I stopped doing that commute back and forth and I rented a place and I, I stayed there. Um, <clears throat> so I did, you know, I, I didn't really, like I said, I, I didn't drink. I don't do drugs. So my way of coping was I worked and that was my way of getting out of the house and doing something and getting out of my own head was helping other people, which is the thing that makes me feel good and always has. So I worked, which is great, you would think, but I worked and 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 I didn't eat very well and I didn't really look after myself and I didn't rest. And when they would call me for overtime, I would always say yes because what else am I going to do with my time? I'm going to sit around and watch a season of Scrubs. There's totally nothing with binge watching a season of Scrubs, just so you know. If you haven't seen it, get on it. It's amazing. But what that meant was I was not managing my health. I was not managing my mental health. I was not managing my physical health. My sleep was pretty awful. And much like my previous station, I didn't really have anyone that I felt I wanted to talk to about what was going on with me. So 2006, I started the year. <laughs> I started the year with pneumonia. Literally, Christmas Eve, uh, New Year's Eve, New Year's Day, and three weeks after that, I had pneumonia. And I ended 2006 um, with anemia, uh, vitamin B deficiency, uh, insomnia, and I was on antidepressants. Good start, right? Are we all excited? Can we all just appreciate how fantastic my first year and a half in ambulance was? Um, I look back now and think, well, why did I stay in there? Why, why didn't I get out earlier? Why did I stay for 10 years? Um, and we'll get to that. We'll talk about that too. Um, so basically, look, I stayed in Shepparton, um, with some beautiful, beautiful people and I maintain friendships with people up there to this day and, and I left there seven years ago. Um, there's some amazing clinicians, some amazing CIs and some amazing people uh, at that branch, both current and ex, and they heavily contributed to make me the paramedic that I was after that and the person that I am now um I, I could throw some shout outs but I don't know if they're watching or care so uh just know that you know this, I'm not tiring everyone with the same brush all I'm doing is relating to you my experience of that period of time uh whilst I had four and a half years four four to four and a half years at Shepparton I built a house on my own in Marutna, which is a small town, like five to ten minutes drive uh, over a, a river from Shep. And then, like I said at that point, I was so sick of moving around. Uh, so I was really keen to settle. And I thought, well, this is where I've landed. This is where I'm staying. So I built my house, which I adored and I loved, and I loved the process of it and, and everything. Um, I ended up meeting my now husband and my two eldest children 
uh, during my time there as well. And, you know, in my darkest moments, thinking out what was the point of it all, what was the point, why did I have to go through all that? Um, I look to them and I know that that's part of what I got from that experience was having the joy of meeting the love of my life and his two kids whom I also adore and if nothing else, and there was lots other else, but if nothing else, I got that. I got that from that time. I got my family and that makes everything totally worth it. I also collected some pretty terrible things while I was in Shepparton. I had my first fatal car accident while I was stationed at Shepparton Branch. I went to a murder-suicide that involved children as witnesses when I was at Shepparton. I went to another murder when I was in Shepparton. It's a lovely place. <laughs> um, I went to lots of assaults, lots of glassings, lots of drug and alcohol-related jobs, and certainly some that stuck with me for a really, really long time. Uh, and at the time, the process of debriefing and mental health support after those jobs, in the nicest way I can put it, was somewhat lacking. On some of those occasions, I did get a phone call or two from peer support, which were local AV members, uh, local uh, members of the Shepherd and Branch that were checking in, um, and and not a whole lot more, to be honest. Um, so when people say to me, you know, how do you, how when how long have you had PTSD? When did you get it? How long is a piece of string? You know, how do you know? I don't, th I don't think I can measure that. And maybe you can. Maybe in your experience, your, your experience of PTSD, there was one incident and from that day on you knew you were in trouble. There was, there was something wrong. For me, I feel that it was a gradual decline in my mental health and an accumulation of events and experiences and feelings that led to my eventual diagnosis, which came a lot later, which was about 2013. So to get us there, um, I, like I said, I, I met my beautiful, amazing superhero husband uh, whilst in Shepparton in 2008. We were married at the end of 2009 because we just make a decision and then we take action. That's just how we do it. Uh, and then about um, three months after the wedding, we moved to Melbourne, which was February 2010. And I had applied for a job at a cool branch. Now, you young whippersnappers probably won't remember cool, and this makes me sound really old. Um, Metropolitan Melbourne used to have some cool branches on the outskirts of the city, which was a situation in which you would work for eight days on and six days off, and for those eight days on you would work your 10-hour shift and then take an ambulance vehicle home and respond from home in the hours before your next 10-hour shift. There are a whole lot of rules around if you get called out within eight hours of the beginning of the shift then you get a fatigue break and you get a rest and that sort of thing. But essentially you take an ambulance home, you respond from home overnight and then after you've had your your sleep, you are back on for another day and that went on for eight days and then you get six days off. Um, thankfully, I believe, I believe, and I'm sure someone will inform me, I believe they've essentially done away with call. Uh, I don't think there are any call branches left in Metropolitan and Melbourne, perhaps one, but I, I think they've pretty much all been phased out and uh, converted to 24-hour stations. Um, I don't, I don't recommend call. <laughs> um, on paper, it looks, it looked really good to me. It looked like awesome. Well, I can be at work 
and I can be home with my kids and having dinner with them and uh, if I get a job, I'll just go out and do the job. And I think originally the call model worked fantastically in more distance areas because you would it was really designed to look after that local community. So if somebody in that local community needed an ambulance, there would be someone there uh, pretty quickly. Um, in my experience, what happened in reality was that there would be resource deficits further into town and they would be filled by the call car and we would be very often pulled into the general metropolitan Melbourne um, asset pool and be out all hours, not in our local area, um, which was quite frustrating and quite quite tiring. Um, you know, I frequently did 16 or 18 hours before we pulled the pin and said, you know what, I need a fatigue break and we'd essentially get the next day shift off to go to sleep and then start back again on call and um, it was really hard. Um, I loved it. I loved the people I was working with. I loved the community that we moved into. Um, it was hard and it was stressful but I was back in Melbourne. I was closer to my family. Uh, with my new family, which was wonderful. Uh, my parents had a chance to get to know my, my my new husband and my new kids because we weren't so far away. That was great. Um, I uh, fell pregnant towards the end of that year, November 2010. And I continued working normally until about April 2011 where I went on light duties because I had big fat belly because I was growing a human in it. Um, I birthed my human August 2011. He's nearly six now. And um, I had 12 months off. I had 12 months off maternity leave. Um, by the time I got to maternity leave, um, I was the heaviest I'd ever been in my life. I was, um, I was tired a lot and I was also having some other health issues and, um, and lots of investigations and blood tests and, and things like that have been going on over the last few years as well. Um, primarily fatigue and chronic pain were my biggest symptoms. And over that year, I guess those couple of years, 2010, 2011, I started getting a shorter fuse. I started getting pretty cranky. I was, I was tired a lot even before the pregnancy. I was tired a lot on call and exhausted and sore and over it and just these feelings of, you know, how much more can I give? How much how much can I keep just running this marathon of a hamster wheel and just keep going and going and going? You know, I'm not the energizer bunny. I'm getting really exhausted. And then I got pregnant, which for anyone that's been pregnant knows that um, does nothing for exhaustion. Sorry, tea break. Have a quick tea break. Wonderful, thanks. Yeah, pregnancy. If you're um if you're exhausted and in pain all the time and then you get pregnant, you don't expect it to get better. I don't know what I was thinking. Anyway, it all worked out. He's awesome, totally worth it all. He's amazing. So um I went back to work and and I really felt like I had I had no place being there. Uh I did my you know return to work program that that they that the service has but my my confidence, my ego, my Certainty in my own abilities was totally shot. I'd spent a year off. And for anyone in the business 
who's had a month of leave or even two months of extended leave, you know, you really, you, you know, some of you may have experienced that thing where you're a bit fuzzy when you come back and you go, oh, gosh, I better, I better read up on my guidelines. Things are not as fresh and my recall is not as great as I want it. Well, I can tell you after a year, I was really fuzzy. I was really fuzzy and my, my self-talk and my ego took a really good battering around that too. I, um, I wasn't very forgiving of myself at that time. Uh, so I came back to work really scared of getting a sick person, really scared of getting a big job because I wasn't confident in my own abilities. I wasn't confident that I was going to be able to do what I needed to do for that person in their absolute time of need and that was my job. I think sometimes it's called imposter syndrome in that you you turn up to work and you keep waiting to be found out that nobody knows what you're doing. Um, and I, I don't want to make light of it but it's, you know, it's like this probably really badly kept secret that, that there's people walking around in all sorts of jobs, all sorts of roles that think, you know, someone's going to discover that I'm making this up as I go along. I think parents feel that. I think a lot of us have experienced that in different areas of our lives. I definitely had that after a year away. So I came back to work and I worked all sorts of different rosters um, and I, I played around at some different branches. Call had been ceased at the station that I was at, so I got put on reserve and sort of moved around a little bit and then managed to get a spot on a new roster at Endeavour Hills branch, which was great because it was eight-hour shifts and you could sort of work it around school hours and I really hope they've continued that roster. I don't know what happened to it. It was a trial, but I liked it. Um then basically 2012, 2013, things just really spiralled. Having I had no idea at the time that's what was happening. Um, I just knew I was really angry all the time. I was really angry at everything, at everyone. I was yelling at the kids for no reason. I was clenching my fist permanently. My sleep was awful. I was mostly just furious I was just filled with this absolute rage and being angry is one thing and it's tiring being angry but I'll tell you what the the hardest part of being angry all the time is is not letting it out it's like trying to keep a lid on a pot that is trying to boil over it takes so much energy to to keep that push down and not let it out and not let it bubble up that in itself is exhausting. It's suppressing that rage, that fury. Suppressing that is exhausting. And then, of course, when it blows, it's huge. Now, anger is not something that people generally associate with women. We're allowed to cry, but we're not allowed to get angry, whereas men are kind of allowed to get angry, but they're not really allowed to cry, you know, social conformities, that sort of stuff. I broke my hand on the pantry door because I punched it so hard. I kicked a hole in the wall of our bedroom of the house we were renting. Um, I frequently had to go out to the back half of our acre and, and scream at the top of my lungs. I had massive crying fits on the floor of the shower. Crying because of anger, crying because of frustration, crying because of sadness, crying because I had this awful negative energy that was building up inside my body like a toxic black cloud and I needed to get it out. You know, it started in my gut. I almost felt like vomiting a lot of the time because I just wanted to get this horrible blackness out of me. It was just awful carrying that around and so I cried you know I'm talking like full snot ugly cry right like not just like <laughs> give me a tissue I'm you know a Hollywood cry I'm talking like a mega meltdown cry and frequently on the shower floor because I was by myself and and one of the biggest things that I didn't want to do 
was burdened this beautiful family that had let me in. I had this incredible husband and these two kids that were already a family unit and they had, they'd let me into their family and be their mom. And the last thing I wanted to do was be a burden for them. So I didn't want them to see that I wasn't coping. I didn't want them to see that, that I really hated my life. Because I didn't want them to blame themselves because kids do that. And I didn't want to make their lives harder. That's not my job as their mum. Of course, I was not pretending as well as I thought that I was. And as is often the case with PTSD and depression and anxiety is that we are the last to know. So when I came out of the mental health closet and said, I think I have, I think there's a problem, I was greeted with a whole lot of, duh, yeah, no shit, look around, we know, we know, because they'd lived with it, they'd seen it, I wasn't fooling anyone but myself. As far as I was concerned, I was just angry. And I was just doing what needed to be done. And I was just putting one foot in front of the other because I was the major breadwinner for our family. And I couldn't not go to work just because I didn't want to go to work. That's not an option. I felt trapped. I felt stuck. I was obliged. I had duty to my role to, as, a, as a paramedic and duty to my role as a mother and a carer and a breadwinner and a, and a parent and a wife. You know, I had responsibilities. I can't just bail on them because I don't feel like going to work. Or so I told myself. Things all came to a head towards the end of 2013. In the space of three weeks, I attended a car versus child pedestrian that was the same age as my son at the time. Um, fortunately, he, the patient did well. He was quite fine for being hit by a car at three years old. I, on the other hand, was not so great by the time we got to the Royal Children's Hospital and I handed over the patient and I knew that he was being taken care of. I then went and had a complete meltdown and video called my husband because I needed to see my son, even though I knew he wasn't playing in the street. It was about 7.30 at night. I needed to eyeball him. I needed to know he was okay. And that was, that was really emotional. Um, the beautiful paramedic that I was working with at the time, would you believe, Gemma, was pregnant at the time and she was supporting me. She looked after me that night. She made me feel better. She made sure that I spoke to peer support. And um, that woman is a powerhouse. Big ups to Jem. You know, I know you. And uh, you're amazing. And you still astound me to this day. You're one of the strongest people I know. Just, you know, make sure you look after yourself too. Gorgeous. Um, the second job that I went to in those three weeks that really accelerated my downfall was uh, I went to a heroin OD and I hadn't been to one in seven years. Now, I told you guys, I already felt like I didn't know what I was doing, right? I was rocking up for work thinking, man, I hope we don't get anyone sick. I went to my first opiate overdose in seven years. And I couldn't remember the protocol. I couldn't remember the guideline. I couldn't remember how much of the drug to give. I couldn't remember the timings. And I really beat myself up for that. Now, of course, I wasn't by myself. The patient got what they needed. I fulfilled a role. I was useful. I did other things. And other people made those decisions. Um, there were other paramedics there. There was micro paramedics. The job went fine. The patient got what they needed at the time. Nobody was compromised. But by God, I beat myself up for that. 
it was just more evidence that I had no right being at work. I had myself convinced that the community would be safer if I didn't turn up when they called triple O. At the same time, I couldn't not go to work. I had bills to pay. I had mounds to feed. I was stuck in that dilemma. The third job I went to was a cardiac arrest. Very common job for a paramedic. I hadn't been to one in over two years. And again, had not been in the headspace to do the appropriate study. Hadn't looked after my my clinical competency and felt lost. Again, the patient wasn't compromised. They got everything they needed. Everything was done. There were other paramedics there. I contributed. And there are people that were there that would probably tell me, you did fine. That was fine. It was cool. You helped. You were. You did everything you had to do. It was great. But in my own head, my perception of my contribution was that I was hopeless and I didn't know what I was doing and I shouldn't be there and blah, blah, blah. Those three events precipitated me to start thinking some pretty horrible thoughts. I started thinking about, pardon the cat, I started thinking about driving into a tree really quickly and I even had the tree in mind. I had the stretch of road, I had the tree and people would say to me, hey, hi, how are you? And I'd say, well, I've been thinking about driving into a tree a lot. And they'd look at me like, are you, are you serious? I said, yeah. I, w- I wouldn't do it. I would never do it. I would never do that to my family. I'm not a selfish person. I've seen what's left behind after suicide. I would never have done it. But it, well, I was thinking about it a lot. And I now recognise that's what we call things like intrusive thoughts is that, You think about things you don't want to be thinking about. I was being haunted by faces of people that had died in the last, you know, eight years that I'd been in the job. They were visiting. I'd see these faces flash up in front of my face when I really wasn't interested in seeing them. And I was thinking about, I was really visualising driving into a tree really quickly. (sighs) I'll tell you what happens when you say that to enough people in the space of about a week is that several people make phone calls to peer support. The system worked to the extent that it worked and several calls were made to peer support. You better go and check on Lisa at Endeavour Hills. And it led to a peer support visit, which led to my team manager being aware, which led to my group manager being aware and after about a week and a half to two weeks of telling people I was thinking about driving into a trailer, when they asked, you know, how are you? I wasn't volunteering the information, but they asked the question, so I answered. I got a phone call from my group manager informing me that I didn't need to show up for work that day. Unfortunately, I was already at work when he called. He told me to go home and um, set up a meeting to discuss what was going on in four days' time. That was a Wednesday. The meeting was for the following Monday. He was since informed that if you are concerned about somebody's mental health, leaving them to stew in their own thoughts for four days, contemplating everything they've done, everything they have said to any person, and wondering what they have done wrong is probably not the best way to go about it. I really hope that that doesn't happen anymore. And that's basically it. That was my last on-road shift, which from memory I think was um, around the third week of November 2013. That was the last time I worked an emergency shift and I never got to go back. I did some light duties. I did some clinic car stuff until um, August 2014 when I was approved for my temporary disability pension through my superannuation company after being assessed multiple times by psychiatrists 
uh, who all agreed you really shouldn't be in that job anymore at this time, which was pretty, that was a good, good decision. I was definitely not in a state to be aware. Um, I miss the job. There are definitely aspects of being a paramedic that I miss. I miss my tribe. I miss my people. I miss telling war stories. I miss having really inappropriate conversations at a table where people are eating and nobody bats an eyelid because that's totally normal. I miss the black humour. I miss people understanding where I'm coming from. I miss making a difference in people's lives every day. And that sort of leads me into how I came about to be doing what I'm doing now. So I'm not going to keep you for much longer today. I just I wanted you guys to know that when I say I get it and I've been through it, I punched the walls, I screamed at my kids, I've cried an ocean of tears, I've said horrible things to myself, I have felt awful, I've thought about and done harm to myself. I've been at the bottom of that abyss. I understand what it is like to not have hope, to not see any way out, to be consumed by darkness and just see black and not know which direction to take that first step in because you don't know if you're going to hit a wall. I get it. I really get it. And I wanted you to hear my story, to understand that when I say that I I get it, I actually get it. And, you know, I might have overshared. That's the thing that happens that I do. Um, I hope, you know, nothing was too uncomfortable. I didn't want to go into too many details. I don't want to trigger anybody. I just want you guys to get that I was there and now I'm here and I will do another one of these that explains how I did that, 2014 to 2017. What the hell? What did I do? What happened? How did I end up being a coach and not in a special white room with a jacket that does up at the back, which was totally, totally an option in 2014, I promise you. So I really hope that this has given you guys the insight that you were looking for into Lisa Westgate, the PTSD coach. Uh, For those that wanted to know, for those that didn't, God, I hope you tuned out before now. It's been an hour. Please visit my website, www.theptsdcoach. I am, I promise you I am working on some stuff. I am working on adding in some resources and uh, some really helpful information for you guys and some links and all sorts of things. I'm working really hard on it. Um, I'm going to work on, um, on, on some, other, some other exciting things as well. Um, I'm hoping to do some of these ideally once a week and topics thing like um what is ptsd why do emergency services and military get it so much more than the general population why are we overrepresented in these statistics what happens in the brain that leads to this uh debunking some myths perhaps and some some options in terms of healing and I will definitely be explaining to you how I got to this point without going down the traditional, in inverted commas, Western medicine road. That was not the path for me. I didn't want to go in and sit on somebody's couch and talk about the worst parts of my life week after week. So I didn't. 
And I will tell you in the next episode of Paths to Recovery, which I've decided to call this, um, what path I went down and how I got myself well without going down that particular road, um, without judgment of any options. That wasn't the one for me. So, look, I really hope this has been beneficial. I'd love some feedback. I'm going to stop rambling. Please share this with anybody that you feel would benefit and much peace, love and rock and roll to you all and hang in there, do what works and I look forward to seeing you next time.